Hey guys, I'm William Dyer. This is Dyer Conversations. Welcome to today's podcast where we have a special guest, Joe Marino, on to talk about the Shroud of Turin. Because as some of you guys may know, I was dealing with it in a previous podcast. And um, I readily admit it, I do not have an expertise in the uh, area. So I wanted to bring on some people who do so that we could discuss the evidence. So Joe, thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, just so for our audience who doesn't know, um, you reached out to me because of a podcast I did with Ted Wright. In that podcast, he's an archaeologist. We got talking about the shroud a little bit. I said, look, I'm a skeptic. I don't really think I buy into it, but I haven't done a lot of research. Um, now, somehow you found that episode and reached out to me. So kind of tell me a little bit about how that transpired and why you reached out. Well, um, I generally search YouTube every day for new videos. I, I a person that kind of just keeps up to the minute on the shroud. I've been studying it for 44 years and, um, you know, write research on it constantly. I'm retired now from Ohio State University and uh, pretty much do full-time shroud research. And, you know, when I search out videos, I watch them and um, depending on how how good the quality is and the uh, the quality of the podcasters and so on. I, I sometimes reach out to the people that do the broadcast to um, give them some more information because um, I do keep up on it. And sometimes people aren't aware of all the research because it is a very complex subject. And um, I enjoyed the, uh, the video that you and Ted did. And I thought, well, maybe these guys would be interested in, in more information. And sometimes I, you know, I send in for a lot of information out. Sometimes I never hear back uh, from people, but um, I was glad uh, you reached uh, back out to me. Yeah. And I mean, I was telling you this uh, before we started the recording is that, um, you know, I'll get comments and people will respond to me and they kind of puff themselves up as, Oh, I've done this or I've done that. Or I know, I know, you know, all this information, but I looked you up, um, you know, and, in the shroud, I guess, documents of evidence, you know, the different scholars and research, like your name consistently pops up and you've written a couple books on the topic, correct? Right. Um, my first book came out in 2011. It was called um, Wrapped Up in the Shroud, Chronicle of a Passion. Um, and that sort of was, I like puns. So that's a pun yeah. because the, it refers to uh, uh, Jesus literally and me figuratively. And then I updated the book, revised and updated it in uh, May of 2020, about a year ago. And then um, this past November, I came out with a 800 page book called um, the, the um, 1988 C14 Dating of the Shroud of Turin, a stunning expose. And um, I documented all the issues that we're going on pretty much behind the scenes that most people don't know about. And um, I knew I'd come up with more material for that. And I don't want to constantly come up with second, third, fourth editions because getting a book is kind of painstaking and a lot of work time intensive and stuff. So I, I planned, or I, I have a page on my website dedicated to um, additions and corrections for the book. Now, what's your website? Um, it's homestead.com slash new vistas. One, uh, new vistas is one word. Okay, cool. And, I'll link that uh, in the description below this video. If anybody wants to go check that out, um, you know, obviously keeping up um, like up-to-date information. Cause when I looked on like one of the big websites is shroud.com, right? Oh, that's the best. That's the biggest yeah. and the best. Yep. Um, is that the one that's run by Barry Schwartz? Right. Okay. So Barry Schwartz, another big name kind of in this category of scholars. Uh, he's a Jewish guy if I remember right. correctly. Yes. Yep. So he's not a Christian, Correct. He's a Jewish guy who's been investigating this as well. Um, and from what I can kind of pull from his material, again, not doing a crazy amount of research on it, is that he does believe that it very well likely could be Jesus, but he doesn't believe in the resurrection clearly because he's uh, a Jewish guy. That's correct. All right. So, so that's kind of where Barry's coming from, but his, yeah, he's kind of like the stable website. Now on that website, your name pops up a few times. So that's what I was saying that, uh, you know, Joe is no slouch here, Joe, you know, one guy commented and said, a lot of people will say, 
that they've studied something for 40 years when really they read a book 40 years ago. And I was like, well, that's a legitimate critique. You know, I've met people like that. Oh, I've been doing such and such for 20 years. No, you did it 20 years ago once. It doesn't mean you're still doing yeah. it or that you're an expert on it, but you are like, you keep up to date on it. You're, you know, that's how you found my podcast. And uh, thanks again for reaching out. Um, I am excited to have you on here today because I ha I do have some questions. You know, I wanted to pick your brain on some things and, and give you some um, pushback and see how you can, as I told Ted, hey, tell me why I'm wrong. Um, you know, tell me why I should believe it. But let's start off um, with what is the shroud? You know, for somebody who might kind of know a little bit, but don't doesn't really know exactly what it is. What is the shroud of Turin? Um, it's a rectangular linen cloth. It's about 14 and a half feet uh, long and three and a half um, feet wide. And it contains the, the front and back image is uh, of a, what appears to be a crucified man. Uh, there's a gap, a, a small gap between the two images. Um, and it, it, it's not real clear to the naked eye. You can sort of tell it's the form of a man, the front and the back. Uh, there, there appears to be different wounds and blood stains, and there's uh, markings from uh, repairs after a fire that it was uh, in in 1532. And uh, it's a three to one herringbone weave, uh, which is kind of rare. It's, it's, it's a, a well-to-do cloth or somebody, whoever bought it was well-to-do certainly because it a lot of linen claws are a one-to-one -one plain weave, but this is a very expensive three-to-one herringbone weave. Um, but what really got people's attention, I mean, it was known, pretty well known in Europe. Um, you know, we know exactly where it's been since the 1350s. Uh, before that, we have a good idea of where it was, but the, the history isn't clear but uh, we know exactly where it's been since 1357. And uh, it was pretty well known in Europe um, between the 1350s and the 20th century. And it wasn't really known in America very, very much at all until the late 70s when um, a group of American scientists called the Shroud of Turin Research Project or STIRP um, and Barry Schwartz was the documenting photographer on that team. Uh, they were given permission to go to Turin and um, they were given five days, 120 hours to study the shroud um, around the clock. And I think Barry was, uh, for the 120 hours, I think he was awake for some, some ridiculous figure like 110 of them. Uh, <laughs> um, but. So Joe, tell me, tell me, can you, yeah. um, I want to share this on, uh, my screen right now. Let me know if it pops up for you. Are you seeing the shroud right now? Yes, that's the frontal image. Okay. That, so, that's half of it. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who's watching the podcast right now, you're going to see the head up here, right? You can see the hands crossed right about here. This would be about where the kneecaps are. And then obviously the feet right. are down here. And and so you talked about um, the, and I wanted to, you know, kind of show people this, but I also wanted to show them um, there's a negative image. Right. Yes. That's, that's supposedly like uh, it brings it out even more so. So let's um, let's pull that up here. OK, you see that one? Yeah, that's that's the the negative. And that's not actually is quite as clear as a lot of the pictures you can find. OK, but. Um, you know, it comes out. Positive on the negative, which means that the shroud image is sort of like a photographic negative mm -hmm. in the beginning. So this is what really jump started uh, the scientific investigation into the shroud when the first public photographs were taken in 1898 by a um, uh, Italian lawyer named Secundo Pia. He was uh, an amateur photographer. You have to keep in mind, photography was only about 30 years old at the time. And um, so, you know, when it came out, so lifelike on the negative, people said, well, how was this formed? And that started um, a lot of the scientific investigation. And so, that, so that negative image didn't really come out until you said the late 1800s. 
Right. That would, is that, so because originally, you, you know, you have the cloth and obviously nobody's taking pictures of it because you don't have photo photography. So this guy right. takes a picture and all of a sudden he develops a negative And now you see, and even as you pointed out, this is even as clear as, as if you were actually looking at the negative. It's so much mm -hmm. more clear. And I have seen some of those photos, um, you know, but that's when it first, I like, kind of jumped out and, and this guy, along with some other scholars were like, oh, wow, what do we have here? Right. Yeah. And okay. even there was there was an agnostic uh, French uh, scientist named Yves Delage, who um, presented his findings to the um, French Academy of Sciences around 1902. He was agnostic, but he concluded, sort of like Barry, that uh, just based on the scientific evidence, he believed um, that it was the historical uh, burial cloth of Jesus. And a lot of the atheists in the French Academy practically boot him off the stage when he, when he made his findings. So it, it really causes uh, a lot of emotional feelings in people. Well, and, th and that's the deal. So people immediately jump to what are the ramifications of it rather than what is actually the cloth telling us, right? And that's the problem is they jump to the ramifications of, oh, if it's authentic, that means Jesus most likely rose from the dead. Right. I can't accept that conclusion. Therefore, I have to attack right. the actual shroud, which is, I mean, that's, come on, that's so subjective. You know, I, mm -hmm. I'm, again, I'm coming from a skeptical standpoint only because this is a very, very unique piece of finding. So I'm like, well, you know, we got to see what the data says before I accept it. However, I'm not just going to reject it outright. I mean, this is something that has been studied for decades, very intensely by scholars, archaeologists, you know, people who, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going to talk about the pollen, the, you know, the limestone, all these sort of different fields of study have investigated this thing. It's not just something that, um, you know, somebody threw up there and was like, hey, check what I found in my back closet. And everybody goes, well, this proves the resurrection. I mean, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. Even if you want to reject it and say you don't think it's Jesus, there's still something there to try to figure out. Yeah. Um, so I just want to lay that out there from the very get go with people. Um, let's do this. I mean, obviously, you know, you've written, like you said, an 800 page book on some on it. You've written 400 page books on it. There's so many other videos and things out there. So we could spend all day weeks on this topic, but I want to, I want you um, to give like the rundown of here's the main like lines of evidence. You know, when we investigate the cloth, here's the main things that we point to to say, we think this is an image of Jesus. All right. Well, first of all, it is, uh, I don't think I'll get too many arguments on this, but it is literally the most intensely studied artifact in human history in terms of the amount of hours put in by researchers. Um, not just religious relics, but artifacts, period. Um, hundreds of thousands of hours have been spent um, I think uh, John Jackson, who was co-founder of the um, Shroud of Turn Research Project group, I think I estimated a few years ago that he had personally has spent, um, now it's probably closer to about 50,000 hours in his own life uh, studying it. Um, it. It has been researched intensely by numerous scientists and researchers and surgeons and doctors. I mean, some people, I've, I'm 44 years, a lot of people have studied it 50 years and more. And I can't help believe that, um, but believe that so many doctors and surgeons could, could study this and, and they don't come up with reasons to, to show it's a fake. Now it's 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 kind of indirectly going at the at the proof or you, I don't think you can 100% prove that it wrapped Jesus. We don't have his DNA or anything like that, but I think you can come pretty close to making a reasonable conclusion based on the evidence that it that it um, wrapped the historical Jesus. I think we we accept a lot of things as fact. Different ideas and, and assertions that that have a lot less evidence for it than the than the shroud shows so once the the science started it in 19 at 1898 excuse me uh, over the years we've we've discovered 
some really interesting qualities that would would be, I think, virtually impossible for a medieval forger um, to incorporate. And, and those would include, I think my top three would be the fact that the image is superficial, which means that it's only on the top several thousandths of an inches of the fibers. So a individual thread is made up of uh, like about 200 uh, microfibers. And the image lies only on the top one to two microfibers. Now, how do you do that? How does an artist do that in the 14th century when we can't even do that today? So, so just so people know, um, the main, I guess, argument on the other side is, hey, this is a medieval forgery, but somehow in the medieval ages, they did some sort of painting or in some sense dyed it or whatever to transpose this image here. And it, it doesn't, you know, represent anything from the first century. So that's what Joe's referring to here. But so I understand this because I'm, I'm a little bit acquainted with this, but again, no expertise. You have a fiber, right? And obviously when you put it under a microscope, it's, you know, it's got layers. And you're saying this image is only on the very top part of that layer. Whereas if it's, if there's a painting, you know, if I take a paintbrush and paint something or dye it, that stuff's going to bleed through. Exactly. Like, you know, same thing is like, if I get a stain on my shirt, right. it's going to go through and it might hit my undershirt because it's bleeding through. Right. All right. Now, so my question to you is if Jesus is, or whoever is wrapped in this thing, mm -hmm. is that image on the side that the body is or on the other side on the exterior? Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it's on the inside. Okay. So where the, the front, where the front part of the body touched the cloth, the, the part of the cloth was over on the top of him, And then the other half was underneath him. So if it was so, doing kind of like a bleed through, it would be going from the actual skin out of the cloth. That's kind of the direction of the way it's going, even though it's very much just on the top layer of that, that thread. Well, the scientists actually think that, um, that the blood, the markings of the blood were, were basic, were contact. In other words, the, the blood, there was blood on the body and it, then it soaked into the cloth. That does go through. The okay. image itself though, only stays on the top several thousandths of an inch of the fibers. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be two different mechanisms and there even seems to be image where the cloth possibly didn't even um, touch the cloth. So in other words, the nose, the cloth would have touched the nose, of course, but possibly not the eye sockets, but you still have the image images of the eye sockets. Sure. So it, it almost seems to be some sort of um, vertical, vertically collimated short term radiation burst. I mean, nobody, basically nobody can figure it out at this point and we we mm -hmm. may never be able to do that um that's that's one of the mysteries of it yeah so what i've read is like his left knee would have been sticking up a little bit so you're saying like hey if his left knee is sticking up maybe his right knee is not touching the fabric however we still have an image on the fabric yes. of the right knee and the leg and, and that sort of thing so that's what makes it interesting because you're like you're saying it's it's not a contact you know the, whatever whatever is making this image is not coming from a direct contact with the body. Right. Because if, you know, if you put, if you put a wrap a cloth around your face and have any kind of liquid or paint or pick, and you, once you un, unfold the cloth, the image is going to spread out, but we don't have that. We have, we have the, the perfect um, depiction of the face as it was, which, which makes the scientists feel like it, uh, it came out, uh, one scientist said it was like um, a, a laser coming out of every pore of the body instantaneously, in, instantaneously, but of a very short duration. Because obviously, if if you radiate a cloth too long, it'll it'll destroy the cloth. Now so this it is, seems to be short term duration. Yeah, and you're seeing the face here that I'm sharing. Yes. Yeah. So this would be the original. Um, you know, and then this is a negative, obviously, which is, you know, when you, when you get close up like that, it's like, well, that's some detail, you know? So is there any, when we look at this, let's talk a little bit about what are some unique 
aspects about we what we learn from that, like the injuries to the body that lead us to the point to say, you know, that really sounds like what happened to Jesus. Right. Um, well, the crucif the, the Romans crucified thousands of people. Um, uh, you can't say that everyone was exactly uniform, but what stands out about the shroud is that uh, and when you compare it to the gospels, of course, is that the, the shroud image shows a, a cap of thorns and not, not a crown of thorns as we usually see in art, but the, a cap that went over the, the full head. All right. And that wasn't a normal part of crucifixions. Now, is that something that you can see on these, uh, on this image right here? Uh, you can see the blood, the white part in the top of the head. Those, those are blood stains. Um, so you can see, and then the, uh, the, the look sort of like the three um, right figure in, that's blood on the forehead okay. from the, from the, um, from the head. So, so you're saying, so you're saying that it's a cap of thorns, not a crown of thorns. Yes. Okay. Would I mean, there, would there be any significance to that? Or is it just a matter of kind of like, that's an extra detail that we learned from the injuries of this? Um, yeah, I mean, no, like I say, normally in art, you see um, a circlet, but you know, a Roman soldier is not going to take the time to nicely form a, a round circlet. I mean, he's going to mm -hmm. grab a clump of thorns and, and s slap it on there. So um, the um, image of the shroud differs a bit from some of the artistic uh, renditions of the shroud. And I guess the other big one in that regard is the fact that most art will show, show the um, nail going through the center of the palm, but experiments have shown that um, that can't sustain the weight of the body. And the uh, shroud shows the wound more toward the wrist, possibly going through part of the palm, but going through the wrist, which is more secure. And that's actually, you know, consistent for people who don't know um, with other archaeological findings of first century crucified people is that that's where they would drive the nail through, you know, kind of like you said right there at the base of the palm or maybe even into the wrist. And in the Greek language, which is what the New Testament was written in, the word for hand, wrist and forearm is all right. the same word. So when you read in the New Testament, hey, he, you know, he had nails in his hands. You could literally just as easily translate that he had nails in his forearm or right. he had nails in his wrist. So in case anybody out there is wondering, you know, if that contradicts what the New Testament says, just FYI. So continue. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's the, the cap of thorns, the, the uh, wrist. He's got a, a wound in the side, which matches, matches to the lancia. Um, the size of the wound in the shroud image matches exactly to that a Roman uh, that Roman instrument called the lancia from that period. Um, there are scourge wounds, um, hundreds of them. Now, this, the 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 scourge usually had um, it was usually three thonged and had uh, bits of bone or metal, and um, you know tore out um, chunks of flesh. Now, normally when a, um, a man was to be crucified, if he was even scourged at all, it would be very lightly because they wanted him to die uh, as a crucifixion victim because scourging could get so severe that you could die from scourging. And if a Roman soldier scourged somebody that was supposed to be crucified and they died from the scourging, that Roman soldier would be put to death. But interestingly enough, the shroud image shows a severe scourging. But then you remember, if you look at the Gospels, Pilate had Jesus severely scourged with the intention of hoping that the, that would um, make people so, feel sorry for him and they wouldn't call for his crucifixion, but it didn't work. And so Jesus was both se severely scourged and crucified. So all those things together, um, you know, matched specifically to Jesus. And probably I would say the icing on the cake with that is that, well, it's not specifically related to the wounds, but the fact that you have that image and we don't have any other burial cloth in the world with full front and back images and that we don't know how the image got on there. 
because most if you even have a burial cloth, the most you usually have is is blood stains because the decomposition fluids normally would um, destroy the cl the cloth along with the body. So all those things put together, and the fact that the image might suggest the resurrection of Jesus, I think you have to say that uh, it's not a big leap of faith to say that this probably wrapped the historical Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, so this is the important point, right? Like, here's the, here's the rub for me, is that we have an image, clearly. It is, it is unexplainable as far as the techniques that we know on how to make something like that. Like, we can't replicate that. Like right. that's, that's the thing, right? Like we're like, we don't know how that's made. Now that doesn't necessarily conclude, well, then somebody was resurrected and it's because it's very much matching up to what happened to Jesus. It's Jesus, right? So are there any other, you know, like positive data to say, it's not just that we don't know how this image was made. It's that this image can only be made through some sort of radiation coming through the cloth. Yeah, in fact, some Italian scientists um, in Italy around 2010 did, did several um, years of experiments and they had a, a piece of experimental linen and they um, exposed, they used an eczema ultraviolet laser and zapped the control linen for one forty billionth of a second and they were basically able to approximate the coloration and the depth penetration of the shroud but the big nuance to that is that to do a for you know a front and back image the amount of energy that you would need we don't we don't have that amount of energy available on the planet today to be able to duplicate that on a large scale basis. So that so was a that, that was a radiation thing that they did. Yeah. So they hit the cloth with a radiation beam, I guess. Yes. Or, okay. Eczema laser, ultraviolet eczema laser. Okay, and you're saying that doesn't even compare with what would have been needed in order to make the image. We don't even have the equipment today to do that to do a 14 foot long cloth. Yeah. So that I mean, because if you anybody who's like first getting introduced to this like i remember i told ted look the first time i saw it it was like some history channel documentary on it which as a 15 year old high school student i didn't know how goofy the history channel was um you know but now i understand the sort of scholarship or lack thereof that that they have on a lot of those programs especially when it relates to biblical stuff so it is it seems to be and again i'm no expert on this but it seems to be that all the experts, again, PhD people, scientist people, like we're not talking about just some preacher down in, you know, some Bible Belt state. Legitimate scholars are saying there's no way that this is a painting. There's no way this is dye. In fact, we have no idea. We don't even have the technology to replicate this. So we don't know how it happened. I mean, is that a reasonable thing to say? Yeah. And, and I might okay. point out that, the, you know, um, those that say it's a painting or pigment or dye or there there's none of those things found on it they the the, the fibers that are um discolored are de they're degraded um by dehydration and oxidation of the cellulose fibers uh, an analogy might be if you if you put a, a newspaper on a windowsill and the sun hits it after a couple of days you'll you'll notice that the the cellulose in the paper has has um, yellowed. Now that's not because somebody came along and put some yellow paint or liquid on it. It's the, the cellulose fibers have degraded, and and so there there's nothing added to the cloth to get that image. Yeah. So I mean, to me, that's like that's a pretty important point. It's like okay, we have no idea how this image happened, right? So that should give us a little bit of pause. If, you know, again, if you're coming from a skeptical standpoint, like I am, um, but again, as I said on the podcast with Ted, like I'm open to it. I just think it's very weird that this would be a piece of evidence that God gives us. And again, I could be totally awful on that. And that's fine. I'm willing to be wrong. That's why we're doing 
this podcast and I'm starting to become more and more interested in it because there is evidence behind it. So we know it's not a painting. We know it's not dye. We don't know how the image um, was made. We also see that there are wounds on the image, right? That are consistent with uh, what happened to Jesus, the description that happened in the gospels, which is also consistent with what happened to Roman scourging and crucifixion victims. Is there any debate like from the people who detract from this say no it's a forgery is there any debate over like the signs of the wounds like is there anybody out there who goes no 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 it wasn't a crown of thorns he could have been injured like this on his forehead or no that wound in his side is actually something else like what do those people say um i haven't seen too much um pushback on on the actual wounds um but you know Another point in favor of authenticity is the fact that um, the consensus seems to be that the, the blood went on first and then the image went on afterwards because um, where, where there's image, there's no blood underneath. So the, you know, it was protected. Um, that part was protected. So that suggests that a forger um, would have to, if he was forging it, he's not going to put the image on, um, put the blood on first and then put the image around there to match it. Yeah, like if you're you painting know? a painting, right, you're not going to paint, you know, like long hair and then paint a head to go on it. Right. right, you're gonna paint the head, and you're gonna paint the hair. That's kind of exactly. what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So, um, you know, the 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 skeptics um, kind of basically say, um, well, e even though we don't know how it was done, that doesn't mean that it couldn't have been done. Which is true. I'll, I'll give them that, but given the amount of knowledge, especially medical, not to mention archaeological, biblical, just the, all the different kinds of knowledge uh, a medieval forger would have needed, um, I just find it virtually impossible for somebody at that time to, uh, to been able to do that. So along with the, as I mentioned, the superficiality, um, and we've already talked to soup, uh, we got the, the three dimensionality, superficiality, and negativity of the image. So why why would a forger, how and why would a forger incorporate all those things, um, something so elaborate when simple things would could fool people in those days? Um, you know, the negativity aspect, it's, that's 500 years before photography. It's got three-dimensional image, uh, spatial encoding information. So what do you mean by that? Well, it, it's, um, there's, a, there's a device, which is outdated now, called the VP8 image analyzer. And um, you can get computer programs to, to do the same thing that that did back in the 70s. But they put, uh, it, it was used to sort of like um, bring out relief in, th in three-dimensional objects like, you know, to study the planets and whatnot. And in 1976, some of the scientists that eventually joined STIRP put a picture uh, of the shroud in this VP8 image analyzer. And normally when you put any other picture in there, um, it, it's... It's, un, it's not proportional. Everything's smashed together. You can hardly tell it's a face if you put a picture of a face in there. But much to their surprise, the shroud image came out in perfect, well, almost perfect, I guess, um, three-dimensional relief. People do dispute how, how good the, the 3D image is. Um, Have they done any new 3D imaging since that one, since you said it's outdated? Um. Yeah, you can find um, some things online. There's some, I've seen some fantastic uh, uh, new or recent um, 3D images. Uh, there's a French 
researcher, I think his name is Theory Castex. And uh, I think it's Theory, T-H-I-E-R-Y-C-A-S-T-E-X.com. He's got some phenomenal pictures um, on his website, three, some 3D renditions. Um, so, so the deal is like, one of the, I know in the, and again, the limited research that I've done, one of the biggest sticking points is the, you know, carbon 14 dating, right? Um, now that was done. I don't know if it's been done again, but it was done back in what the late seventies, uh, 1988. Oh, 19, oh, late eighties. Okay. So it was done back in the late eighties. Um, but since that time, people who are advocates for the shroud have come back and said, there was a lot of issues with that original dating because that original dating dated it somewhere to the medieval time period. Right. Right. 1260 to 1390. Yep. So what, what are some of the major issues on why we shouldn't accept that test that happened in the late eighties? Well, the biggest, one of the biggest issues is the fact that they only took one sample from a very controversial corner. Originally um, they were going to take samples from at least three different spots. When you say a sample, what do you mean? Like pull a thread out? Uh, you know, they, they cut a, a like a one, by seven piece of centimeter, uh, one one by seven centimeter piece, and that was divided up into three le to uh, with three labs, and they kept an extra portion back. Um, but the reason you want to take more than one sample is that you want to be sure that the sample you take is representative of a whole of the whole cloth. Makes sense. And they took it from an area that had previously been cut upon. We know from history, I've, I've done some research of, and there's been a lot of repairs about the shroud, some documented, some I think undocumented. And um, that, that portion was, was definitely repaired. So um, because there's no other control or other samples to compare it with, you've, you've got one sample and all three labs got the same section. So even though you got three labs coming up with the same results, that's not that impressive because yeah. Yeah, you, don't, clearly. you don't know if the sample is good or not. Um, and later research, my late wife and I um, proposed in, in uh, 2000 that the sample was actually repaired or rewoven. And um, uh, Ray Rogers, who had, was the uh, chemist on the STIRP team, um, he had accepted the, the C14 results. And um, he thought we were part of it. He called us part of the lunatic fringe when we came up with our paper. He, uh, Barry was at the conference in Italy when we presented our paper and he came up to us afterwards and asked if he could um, uh, publishes our paper on a site and we gave him permission and Ray Rogers um, saw it and, and called Barry up and gave him some problems for publishing it and um, Ray said that he had some he still had some leftover samples from the main part of the shroud from the 1978 study and he also had some samples that were right next to the C14 sample because in 1973 uh, a, a portion was taken and given to a, a Belgian textile expert named Gilbert Reyes, R-A-E-S. And those samples you'll, you'll see in the literature are known as the Reyes samples. So Rogers had both Reyes samples from 1973, uh, which were right next to the C14 sample. And he still had some uh, samples from 1978 from the main part of the cloth. So he told Barry, oh, I can I can prove those people wrong in five minutes. So um, he got out of the samples in a microscope and he compared the two. And um, he called Barry back about an hour and a half later. He says, I can't believe it. I think they're right. Wow. Um, so he found, you know, he found a splice thread with cotton and linen. He found a mordant, a dye, all things that you would find if they were... Um, so in later term, what we're what you're saying is the sample that was taken to do the dating looks like it came from a section of the cloth 
that essentially had kind of like a patchwork done to it. Yes. Somewhere along the way between its original, you know, starting point, whether that be with Jesus or somewhere else, and 1988, right? There was some mm-hmm. sort of there was some sort of patchwork, which I mean, clearly in in all that time frame, you know, even if it's 500 years, you know, you're still talking about a lot of time for something to happen to it. So, can you look on on this cloth? Do we know where on this cloth right here? Uh, that yeah. patchwork is or where that sample was taken from? It would be at the very lower left uh, corner at the bottom. Okay, so down down like in this area? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I mean, that makes sense because if you actually look at this thing, I mean, to me, I'm not an expert again, but it looks like there is something going on down here that's a little bit different than the rest of the cloth. Uh, again, not an expert, just it makes sense. Yeah, and if you there's... Uh something called the blue quad mosaics uh, that were taken in 1978. And um, they, they show different colors, which represent different chemical signatures. And where the C14 sample is a greenish color, where most of the, the main part of the shroud is kind of like more on the or- like orangish side. So the, the chemical signatures seem to suggest a different chemistry. And another uh, a blood expert, uh, Al Adler of STIRP, um, found different um, elements in that corner that um, suggested that the, there were uh, repairs there as well. Speaking about the blood, are they able to do any sort of DNA testing with the blood that's on the cloth from the actual image, like the person who made the image? Um, not re- they did some DNA studies in 1995 at the University of Texas, um, but the problem is um, the the DNA at this point is so degraded, plus the fact that so many people have touched the cloth over the centuries that you got um, other people's DNA on it. So there's so the, nothing- so the DNA would even get in like it would basically contaminate the blood samples. That's what you're saying. I'm sorry. The, the DNA of like somebody touching it would corrupt the yes. blood samples. Yeah, because I was thinking right. if they could take the blood samples and look at the DNA, are they able to trace that to go, you know, this is very like this sort of person that would have lived in the first century in, in the Middle East. I, you know, that's just something I would look at and say that would be a strong piece of evidence in the favor of it. Or if they go, no, 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 it's mm-hmm. clearly, you know, somebody from Zimbabwe, then we would go, well, you know, that kind of goes against it, yeah. but they just can't do that test. It, it, they generally, it's generally said that the, the blood type is AB, which is typical of people uh, in the Middle East, more common in the Middle East than, uh, than, than in Europe. Yeah. And so let me, let's stop here for a second. Just, there's two points I want to make. Number one, whenever you're studying something like this, it's important to realize we talked about, you made the statement, well, we can't know with 100% certainty. Well, we can't know almost anything with 100% certainty. You know, basically everything we do in life, we based off of, here's the data that I have. Can I make a reasonable conclusion from that? What is the most reasonable conclusion that I can make from that? We're going to go with that. And so that's, you know, that's how our judicial system works. That's how our normal everyday life works. So we are okay with that when it comes to something with the shroud, right? I'm okay with, what is the most reasonable conclusion? Now we could get to a point which, you know, somebody who hasn't studied this out like me to say, we don't even have enough data to make a reasonable conclusion. That could be an option. You're more on the standpoint of no, 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 there is enough data to make a reasonable conclusion that, you know, the most likely scenario is that this is an image transposed from when Jesus was rising from the dead. Okay. Some other people say, no, it's a forgery but they're still making some sort of reasonable conclusion from the data. So we're okay with not a hundred percent certainty on that. Also, just because every question can't be answered doesn't mean that you still can't make a conclusion, right? So if like, if you're going to uh, investigate a crime and you can, you see, Hey, I got 10 questions and I can answer nine of them. And that one question is really small. Like, Hey, where did that uh, cigarette butt come from? How did it get on the scene of the crime? It doesn't matter. You know, if we have videotape evidence and 15 witnesses, it says that this guy killed the guy who's dead. You know, we don't care about the cigarette butt anymore. So when we're looking at this, this cloth, it's important to distinguish between what are, 
like very high caliber pieces of evidence that we get from it and what are like kind of like less important details about it. Right. Um, so that's important. If, I mean, and that I'm even speaking to myself here is, you know, if, if I keep studying this out to realize not everything is going to be answered. Okay. Now, one thing I did want to talk about um, well, before we jump into that, the C-14 dating. So happened in 1988. There's been some problems with it. I think have come out from what I've read. I think it's reasonable that the original dating was was probably bad and has been debunked now. So I'm okay with that, right? Are they going to go back and do a second round of the carbon dating, or is there a new dating method that's even better than the carbon dating that they can look at to say, okay, now that we can have this new technology, you know, and a little bit of history under our belt, we think this is a better date for it. Um, yeah, actually there have been some, um, new techniques that have been devised. Um, Ray Rogers used one during his study. Um, uh, it's called the vanillin test and, um, vanillin is, is part of the lignin that's, that can be found in the, the cellulose. And basically, um, vanillin dissipates over time. And what he found was that um, the, the main part of the shroud didn't have any vanillin, but the C14 sample area did, which seems to indicate that the C14 area sample uh, area has some more recent cloth in it. Other, you know, because if it was like the rest of the shroud, there would be no vanillin in, in there as well. Um, there's some uh, Italian, there's an Italian scientist named Giulio Fonti who um, came up with three new dating tests. They're, they're kind of complicated. It's like uh, Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy testing of cellulose degradation. There's another one called uh, Raman spectroscopy and another one where he tests, the, he does a mechanical test. Um, checking with the compressibility and the, the, the strength of the fibers. And he thinks now that those, those tests aren't widely accepted in the mainstream yet, maybe they will in the future, but they really haven't been used um, as, as bona fide um, testing techniques, at least on textiles in recent times yet. When did he do them? Um, those were in, since about, I'd say in the last five years, Oh, so pretty new. Yeah. Yeah. So what was his conclusions? Well, he, he believes that based on his three tests and Rogers vanillin tests, um, he came up with um, the figure that, um, let's see, it was the, the, the main date was like 33 BC plus or minus 250 years. So basically in a, in a, pretty relatively close time range to, yeah, you know, for, if it was, so if it was, it was really it. Jesus, then it's that that's a pretty solid time range. Right. Now is he, what is his background? Is he, you know, is he's he an engineer at the university of Padua in Italy okay. and he's been studying the shroud for, Oh, probably 35, 40 years himself. Okay. Is he a Christian? Yes. Okay. I mean, I'm again, I'm, I'm just thinking from a skeptical standpoint, like, mm -hmm. I don't think just because you're a Christian, if you present some sort of evidence in support of Christianity, that that taints it. Um, that's a ridiculous argument. However, there is some weight to somebody like a Barry Schwartz, who's not a Christian, who says, here's the evidence, and it seems to go against my worldview, but in support of another worldview. So right. that does add a little bit of weight to something. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Al, Al Adler, the blood uh, specialist from STERP, was also Jewish and not a Christian, and he believed he he tended to believe that the shroud was uh, authentic. Who was that? Al Adler. Okay, Al Adler, and he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, okay, so that's a C four dating. One one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is, um, when when do we really start seeing this thing pop up on the radar? like where people were talking about it or some sort of, you know, inferences that people knew about it, even if they didn't know what it was, when did it start popping up on the radar? Um, in history, in terms of, of the cloth itself. Um, yeah. 
Well, like I say, uh, we know it popped up in Loray, France. There was an exhibition around 1357. And we have a clear history from that point to now. Um, it, it's, it's been in Turin it, uh, since 1578. That's why it's now called the Shroud of Turin. Um, so, like I say, it, it wasn't real, really known in America till, till the Sturp project. Uh, before that, there was a cloth in Constantinople uh, in 1204. And the thought is that when the Crusaders sacked Constantinople, it was believed that the shroud was, was stolen at that point. And then it was quiet for about 150 years until it showed up in France. Um, now, the only other time uh, before 1578, um, it was a couple places in France, possibly Greece in 1205, that's, that's being studied closer. Um, and then in World War II, it was re actually removed from Turin for a few years and um, taken to a Benedictine monastery in Monte Virgine, uh, Italy, near Rome, to save it, uh, you know, to keep it from being bombed and stuff. And Hitler actually was interested in the, land, the supposed lance that had pierced Jesus and different things of the occult. And he wanted to get his hands on the shroud. And... Um, some of the soldiers actually were at the monastery um, where the, the shroud was being held and hidden. And they were actually a few feet from it. It was uh, hidden somewhere in the church. And the soldiers came in and, and um, they were praying. And the, the, the leader of the, of the German contingent uh, said not to disturb the monks praying and they left. They were literally within a few feet of, of having found it. Um, wow. So there's, so, there's men, many shroud organizations worldwide now. And of course it's, it's a, a big uh, research project for, for many individuals and organizations and groups all over the world right now. Yeah. So here's, here's a question then, right? Um, if the negative image we didn't get that until the 1800s because of photography. Right. Um, it seems as if there's a very faint image on the actual cloth itself. Now, I've obviously never seen the actual cloth. I've seen pictures of it. So how close is what I'm seeing here on my screen? You know, the, the picture that we were showing earlier. So I'll show it again just so um, everybody remembers. How close, when you look at this thing in person, you know, I, th I mean, you could see, obviously, there's a there's something here. There's a person, there's hands, you know, a chest, like I see the legs. How close does that resemble actually seen in a person? Have you ever seen it? Yeah, I've seen it twice. Um, most of this picture and most of the other pictures you see is, is somewhat uh, photographically enhanced. Okay. So what you see with the naked eye, if you're actually in the cathedral when it's being exposed, is I would say is fainter than that. Okay. And another interesting point about it is that um, if you're closer than six, if, if you're within about six feet of the image, you really can't see it. Um, I don't think really? that necessarily makes it totally miraculous, but it almost suggests that or makes you think how, how would an artist been able to do that up close if you have to be six feet away to see it? Well, I would ask, like, it, has it faded over time? You know, maybe the original image was a little bit more, you know, clear. And then it faded over time because of just deterioration. Do you think that's a possibility? Uh, they're certainly worried about um, degradation of the image to the point that some scientists actually think that it, the image is going to eventually disappear. So it has been degrading over the centuries. Um, I usually counter that by by think by saying, you know, if it's the real McCoy and God wants it to be around, he'll take care of that. Sure. Um, that's just the kind of something from a, a faith perspective, but I think it's legitimate to to bring that up. All right. So here then then here's what I want to ask. Okay, if if the image was faint or, or is like it is, like we see it now, right? What would make somebody keep it? and protect it and preserve it all the way until it really pops up on the radar in, in the Middle Ages. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, normally a Jew um, 
would not be dealing with an, what was considered an impure object. If something had touched a dead body, it automatically becomes a, an impure object. I think they, it was kept because it, it um, had wrapped Jesus and Jesus was so special that they decided to preserve it uh, for history. I think it's as simple as that. But from a pure investigative standpoint, that is pure conjecture, right? Sure. Yeah. So like, that's the thing for me is, is what would, what would make somebody preserve it for all those years? Not, I mean, if they said, okay, this is the cloth of Jesus, I could understand them going, let's take this out the tomb before the soldiers come and get it, or maybe somebody else comes and gets it, whatever, or it's destroyed. But then eventually, you know, after five, six, seven, eight generations, you know, so you're still talking four five, 600 AD that it just kind of gets, okay, you know, somebody along the way just discards it or does away with it or, you know, it gets lost because nobody really cares about it anymore. But you would have to say that they knew from the very get-go, hey, this was a burial cloth of Jesus. We want to keep this. And then they had such minute attention to protecting it, preserving it, and passing it down that it was preserved during all that time. But then if that's the case, why don't we hear anybody in history talking about it? Like, do any of the patristics talk about it? Do we hear about it at all in history, in early history? Yeah, it, um, the history is kind of sketchy. Uh, there's there's um, a cloth known as the image of Edessa, and um, that's known to history. And it's believed that, you know, after the crucifixion, when the shroud left Jerusalem, that it eventually went to Edessa, which is now Urfa, Turkey. And um, there's a legend, and, and it's probably not 100% accurate because most legends aren't, but legends are also usually based on a kernel of truth. Mm -hmm. It was believed that there was a King Abgar that um, the cloth was brought to and he was healed um, of leprosy by it. And then the cloth was apparently hidden in, in the city walls. And um, as you said, some lots of time passed in around 544 after a major flood in Edessa, it was apparently discovered in the city walls. And um, then it became known as the image of Edessa. And interestingly enough, right after that was discovered, apparently discovered, the art in history starts depicting Jesus uh, in the typical image that we're used to seeing, which looks very close to the shroud. So the, the image of Edessa was then known to have been taken to um, Constantinople in 944. And interestingly, um, there's good record of it arriving there, I think on August 16th, 9, 944. And two of the emperor's sons, their descriptions have been recorded for history. One of them said that the image seemed to be a, a moist secretion without coloring or stain. And the other son said that it looked blurred so I think those are two very good descriptions of what somebody in the 10th century would describe as what they're seeing when they're looking at the Shroud of Turin. And then um, it, it stayed in, in uh, Constantinople to, to 1204, where, as I said before, it was apparently stolen and then um, was probably hidden away um, by the Knights Templars from post-1204 to about 1350. And then uh, the history is solid from that point. Now, in this image of Odessa, are they connecting it to the burial cloth of Jesus, or are they just saying this is like some sort of mystical cloth that we think has powers? Well, there's the there's a couple there's various descriptions uh, of the image. Most of the time, it's it's described as just a facial image, but then um, there is at least one major document that des describes the full a full image. And that was only discovered, I'd say, within the last 20 years in the, in the Vatican archives. So uh, the historian Ian Wilson, who's probably the, the best writer to, to uh, consult, he's got three or four, uh, four books on the Shroud. He, he deals a lot with the history. Um, part of his theory is that the Shroud was folded so that only the face was showing. 
um, and was kept that way for, for most of the time. And so the image, the, the uh, history sort of recorded that the image was basically a facial image only because that was basically how it was always seen. Now we know that uh, in the Christian church, there was this kind of age of relics, sure. you know, where they were like, oh, this is part of the cross of Jesus. And this is, yeah. you know, obviously we know that, that, I would say 99.9% .9 of those things were just fakes because people trying to make money and, you know, um, trick people or what, or whatnot, but mostly probably make money. So how come this thing wasn't popping up during that time is like, Hey, you want a real relic of Jesus? Here it is. Um, I think, be, I think basically, um, powerful people had it and, and wanted to protect it and it was hidden away most of the time. Um, you know, we can't exactly get into the minds of people in the 10th, 11th, and 12th century to know what they were thinking. But, um, you know, and, and you do have to admit that uh, there were a lot of fake relics, and that's one of the arguments that the skeptics use. But, you know, you can't, you can't say that because, um, for example, if, if there's a fake $20 bill, you can't say that all $20 bills are fake. You know, so just because you have some fake relics doesn't mean that um, the shroud's a fake relic. No, I agree with that. No, that that's a, that's a solid point. Uh, I was only asking in the sense of if this is like the the movement of the day. You know, relics are the big hot thing. Why isn't this thing being pushed as a relic to be sold for you know what would be essentially like a retirement plan? You know, for whoever had it. Like here, I could sell this thing off and just have all the money in the world. Um, you know, that's, that's the thing to me. It might be one of those questions that's never answered is what was happening to this thing between, if it is from Jesus between that and, you know, when it really starts coming up on the radar, even if, even if the stuff from the image of Odessa is, is it like even before that. So like that to me would be a gap that I would want to study and see what sort of evidence we have. Again, it, even if there's zero talk about it, it doesn't mean that now this is a forgery, it yeah. just raises questions, you know, to say, Hey, I would, I would love to see these answered. Um, so yeah, well, I mean, we talked about some of the, some of the evidence for it. We talked about that it can't be pain or die. The wounds that are consistent with what happened to Jesus, not what would happen with every crucified person in the Roman period. Um, were there other periods in time where they were doing a sort of crucifixion that would mimic this? That, that you know of? Um, well, crucifixion was basically outlawed, outlawed in the third, like what, 350s or some, somewhere around that period. Uh, I've seen some people claim that the, that the image on the shroud is from a 14th century crucifixion. I tend to doubt that very highly. Um, I don't think there's much evidence for that. I think, I think after it died out for real in the three fifties or so, um, you know, they, people wouldn't know how to do it. And I, I think any, any actual crucifixions after that time would, would have been very random and, and rare. Yeah. I just wanted to show it again, as you were talking about that, because it, it is pretty interesting to look at. You know, I mean, there's there's clearly an image there, even if it is enhanced. I get it that it might be enhanced from, you know, our photography. The enhancing isn't making something up. It's not putting something there that's not there. It's enhancing what is there so that with our eyes, we can actually see it. Um, and I agree with you that, you know, crucifixion, it, there was a pretty standard, you know, limited time when this was happening. And we don't see that necessarily happening like you said, 1400 or 1200 or 1100 uh, AD. So it would lend more to this thing is coming from one, two, 300 AD. Even if it's not from Jesus, it's still from that time period, right? I mean, I'm just looking at what would the evidence point to? So it would lend to the fact that it, that it could be authentic or at least from that time period. Um, it, if you could have any tests done to it, now, what sort of test would you want done to it? Well, 
I don't know if I, I can get into the specifics in terms of my, my own preference. I mean, I don't know what tests are out there, but I can say that, um, and this goes back to the whole C14 issue, is the fact that in 1986, there was a, a planning workshop in Turin where dozens of scientists from all over the world were invited, including C14 scientists and including the ones that ended up dating it. Originally, they had planned to do the C14 test with 20, STIRP had a proposal, I've got a copy of it, um, and it's online now actually too. They proposed 26 different tests um, that, that would be done um, at the time in the late 80s. Um, believe it or not, STIRP was given permission, this, I, this is recounted in my C14 book, um, Cardinal Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict XVI, um, he approved in July 1985, STIRP getting two weeks with the shroud around the clock to perform all their tests. And it was, and C14 was one of those 26 tests. The C14 labs didn't want any of those other tests done. They wanted only the C14 test. They wanted to, all the, all the newspaper print about it. And at the time, the method that they used on the C14 uh, test was called AMS, Accelerated Mass Spectrometry. It was only about 11 years old at the time. In the old days, they, they needed a, cl a cloth about the size of a handkerchief, but they had improved the method so that um, by the late 80s, uh, all you needed was a couple threads. And they wanted only the C14 test. STIRP had all the experience from their 78 testing. And despite the fact that Cardinal Ratzinger was probably the, maybe the third highest ranking prelate in the Catholic Church at the time, gave permission, somehow some person or group was able to go over his head and get STIRP and the 25 tests eliminated and that only the C14 test was done. And then after the test was done, um, there's all, all sorts of controversies. I could tell you stories for the rest of the night. So there's um, basically a bunch of politics at play in the Politics, it's not just, egos. It's not just a matter of, yeah, it's not just a matter of objective scientific no. investigation. There's a bunch of egos and politics and power at play. I mean, and, and that's what's frustrating too, because again, me, I'm a Christian. And I'm legitimately looking at this thing going, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's it or not. And I'm okay if it's not it because, mm. you know, and I'm sure you would be the same way as this. If this thing is found out to be a forgery, it doesn't mean Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It doesn't mean we don't right. have great evidence from everything else that we do know that's so much more reliable and so much more consistent to say Jesus did rise from the dead. So we just want to know, like, just, yeah. just study it out, you know, instead of all these ego trips that people are on. So who has control of it? Is it the Vatican? Um, the, the, the cloth was actually willed to the living Pope um, hmm. in 1983 by the, the king of uh, Italy, King Umberto, who died. He died in 83, and, and the will was um, finalized in 1985. So he willed it to the, the living Pope and not the Catholic Church as a whole because he figured he didn't want cardinals voting every time something was done to the shroud. Mm -hmm. So the, the living Pope is the, um, is the rightful owner. And then he usually appoints the archbishop, um, who's usually a cardinal, but at the moment, uh, the, the bishop of Turin is actually just a monsignor, not even a bishop. Um, he, the, he, the Pope usually uh, appoints that person as the custodian of the shroud, and it stays in Tur Turin, Italy. So when you said that he is, uh, he pointed it to the living Pope, it's whatever Pope is currently in office, not Correct. that living Pope of his day. Yes. So it'll transfer every time there's a new yep. Pope. Exactly. Yes. Gotcha. 
Okay. So has there been any sort of ability like recently, let's say within the past five years where, you know, the Pope has allowed certain things to be done to it or test or anything like that, or is it being kept like really under lock and key? It's, it's pretty much kept under lock and key. The, um, the next thing on the horizon is a public exposition in, um, 2025, which is only four years away now. Yeah. Um, where's that at? Uh, it'll be in right in the St. John the Baptist Cathedral in Turin, where the shroud is kept all, all the time. It's it's in a special container with special gases to you know help with, with preservation and conservation. Are you going? Um, I might. I, I uh, I'll have to see. Who knows? I mean, life is so crazy. I'm not sure I can predict. You know what kind of shape I'll be in in four years or. Sure. If I have enough money or whatever, <laughs> man, maybe four years of study and I have to tell my wife like, Hey, let's take a trip to Italy. Yeah. And you'd be like, Oh, Hey, check this out. There's an expose that was happening. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. They usually have uh, generally two to 3 million people uh, each time they have an exhibition, but they've, they've streamlined the process. You can make reservations online and it's a lot better than it used to be. Yeah, for sure. So what do you think is the greatest objection to the shroud? Like if all you're studying, you go, Hey man, this is like the, this is the tough one to overcome or at least the greatest objection to it. Um, I'd say it was, it's probably the, um, the lack of a, a clear history before 1357, but it's not, it's not a deal breaker for me because sure. I think there's plenty of good history that uh, plausibly explains where it is where it could have been. Um, I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe the archeologists will find something that'll talk about it in 580 or something. You know, it's a shame the, there was a great uh, library in Alexandria um, mm -hmm. that went down in flames. Uh, I forget what second century or something. Yeah. And I, I, I wonder if there were references to the cloth in there that were lost to history. That's a great point. That is a fantastic, I mean, it was like literally the, the library of the ancient yeah. world. And it burned to the ground. So how much did we lose in that? Yeah. You know, maybe God, um, you know, maybe God, if this is legit, maybe God will bless us with some sort of document from ancient history that helps us to realize it predates the medieval period. And there is some sort of historical linkage to the ancient mm -hmm. world. Uh, I think that would really, that would really bolster mm -hmm. it for me to say like, why did it just randomly pop up? To me, it seems random, randomly pop up at that time period like, why is there all that lost history? I'm not saying it's because it's not legit. I'm just saying yeah. something had to have happened. Maybe it's the fire in Alexandria, or maybe God, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, has some documents hiding in the cave somewhere, and we're going to find them here soon. Um, and it'll blow this whole study up, and, you know, new books will be written about it. Well, I think a, a lot of people um, aren't even aware of, of how much um, unknown data is out there. For for example, yeah. you may, you may want to check... Um, I wrote, I've been writing a series of articles, um, bibliographical articles about various aspects, um, important aspects of the shroud. And one of the ones I, I came out this year was, um, I think it's called possible post-gospel and pre-1350s references to the shroud of Jesus, uh, an English language bibliography. And I think most even a lot of educated people will be surprised at how many references there are in history to possible um, flaws that could have been could actually have been the burial cloth of Jesus. You may want to check that out. Uh, sure, you. absolutely. So, so on that, let's kind of um, you know, again, we could talk for weeks on this thing, right? And it's super interesting, and I'm going to enjoy continuing to study it, and and I'd love to continue to have you as a resource, and maybe even bring you back on one day sure. to say, hey, here's some stuff I've learned, or some more questions I have, but. Uh, and, and kind of parting with this topic, give us maybe some top websites or books that you would suggest for somebody who is wanting to study this topic out. Uh, okay, well, um, probably the best source is, is shroud.com. Uh, it's, it's got everything from, it's, it presents both sides of the, the question, and there's um, material for the layman as well as as the scholar uh as far as the history goes as i mentioned you can uh, go to amazon and look for the various books of um ian wilson 
Um, there's a couple books um, by a lawyer in St. Louis named Mark Antonacci. His most recent one was um, from 2015. It's called Test the Shroud. That's available on Amazon. Of course, your books. My books are both available on Amazon. My first one is more kind of more autobiographical about my research. It has some facts in there, but. Um, and what's that one called? Um, it's called Wrapped Up in the Shroud, mm -hmm. Chronicle of a Passion. And um, like I say, the uh, C14 book, if you want to know about the C14, um, I have to say my book's probably the best one because it's 800 pages, plus I have 75 additional entries on my webpage uh, dedicated to the book. And Pretty extensive research there. So, yeah. you know, absolutely go check it out. Any other books or websites you want to mention? Um, a good blog with a lot of information that uh, unfortunately no longer exists uh, is shroudstory.com. Um, and then there's um, shrouduniversity.com. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of them out there. But I, if you go to Barry's site, you, you, you could spend the rest of your life there. <laughs> All right. Shroud.com. Seems, seems pretty simple. So we'll link some of those things in the description. And uh, Joe, are you on social media at all? Uh, I have a Facebook page for my, my second book. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to be able to link you if you wanted to on, on social media. And um, so if anybody wants to contact Joe, you know, if you can't find him on Facebook, uh, message me or, or leave a comment and I will get you in contact with him. So that way you can continue to study. Um, and Joe, we appreciate you coming on. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. And uh, again, I know we could talk about this for weeks, but super interesting topic. Um, thanks for sharing with us. Great. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye, everybody.